Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Baker Institute. It's a pleasure to see you all here. Good to see the President of the University, David Liebren, here. It's my uh, privilege and genuine pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Her Excellency Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, uh, Secretary Baker and Susan Baker, who are with us this evening, as well as my wife Francoise and I have known Dr. Ashrawi for many years. Uh, some of them spent at the negotiating table. She's a hard negotiator. Uh, she is, of course, an eminent Palestinian legislator, activist, and scholar. She was a member of the Palestinian delegation to the Madrid Peace Conference in 1991 and the Palestinian spokesperson from 1991 until 1993. Uh, she has had many positions, uh, Palestinian Minister of Higher Education and Research, and in 2006, she was elected to the Palestinian Legislative Council on the Third Way Party ticket. This August, she was elected, and I want to underscore the word elected, not appointed. She was elected to the Executive Committee of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO. Hanan is the first woman ever to become a member of the Executive Committee. And I think that could only have been done through elections, not appointment. <laughs> <laughs> women's rights. <laughs> and last but not least, our speaker is the Baker Institute's Diana Tamari Sabak Fellow in Middle Eastern Studies. She has many achievements that are listed in your program notes, and I'm not going to repeat them here. I came to know Hanan very well when I was working for Secretary Baker as Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. We both worked very closely with Hanan over the course of many trips to the Middle East. In his 1995 book, The Politics of Diplomacy, Secretary Baker wrote of Hanan, and I quote, tough, proud, courageous, and occasionally militant. <laughs> she was nonetheless extraordinarily articulate and determined in arguing her brief. Instinctively, I liked her. Ultimately, she became an eloquent public spokesman for the Palestinians, end quote. In my own book, Danger and Opportunity, which didn't sell as many copies as Secretary Baker's book, <laughs> I recount how upon my departure as U.S. Ambassador to Israel in 1994, the American Consul General in Jerusalem hosted a farewell dinner with the Palestinian insider leaders who resided in the West Bank and Gaza. The insiders were contrasted with the outsiders who were the PLO leadership, Yasser Arafat and others, who were not from inside the Palestinian territories. Uh, during the dinner, I commented that among all the Arabs, I had always felt that the Palestinians were in the best position to build a democratic society in the Arab world and to demonstrate respect for human rights, given their own history and culture and their unique experience living next to Israel, they had and still have the opportunity to build a Palestinian society based on democratic principles that, if successful, could have, I believe, a major impact in the Arab world. Hanan is, without question, a passionate advocate for Palestinian people. She's an equally strong supporter of democracy and human rights in the Middle East and the Palestinian territories. She is a strong advocate of peace between Israel and the state of Palestine. She represents the real hope of an independent, self-governing, and prosperous Palestinian state. So ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have her with us tonight. And join me in greeting Dr. Hanan Ashrawi to our podium. <clears throat> Thank you, Ed. As usual, a very humbling introduction. Uh, thank you, Secretary and Mrs. Baker, Susan Baker, Francoise, President, everybody here. It's really nice to see you all in spite of the weather. So you must be either diehards or gluttons for punishment. Um, I also would like to begin by thanking all the people who have made this possible. This is my second visit this year and uh, Ambassador Jerejan in particular, but also uh, the wonderful staff of the Baker Institute, whom I've come to know and appreciate and consider friends. 
Ryan Kersky and Paula Madlen and Melissa Llewellyn. And of course, Jason. Mustn't forget Jason. Where is Jason Leon, who's been really very kind in taking me around. And the wonderful uh, group of students, staff and faculty that I've met in these last two days, and I've had very enriching discussions. Now, it is a pleasure to be here again, a topic close to my heart, as uh, Ambassador Georgian said. It's something that I have been personally involved in for a very long time, and it's a question of a personal commitment as well. It's a very long topic. And um, Ed, you don't know, you, when you asked me, you didn't know that uh, this is something that I'm going to um, dedicate a lot of time to. He said, why don't you write down your lecture? And I said, fine. So I sat down and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. <laughs> and I wrote. And this is it. And you have, if you have the next three, four hours, you can sit down and I'll recite it. But I've decided maybe you'd put it on the website. And I will try to encapsulate a few ideas and major features. And uh, uh, I will keep looking your way so that you let me know when I'm running out of time. <clears throat> Now, whenever people talk about democracy, generally, and I don't want to lecture, but generally they talk about uh, uh, questioning issues, whether there is such a thing as a blueprint democracy, is there such a thing as a one-size-fits-all democracy, uh, or whether, on the other hand, is democracy culturally biased? Is it subject to the specificity, <coughs> specificity of any culture or uh, nation? Is it a subjective uh, issue? Is it, can it be externally imposed or defined? Or does it have to be internally uh, evolved? Is it a prescriptive democracy or is it an organic, so to speak, democracy? Uh, are all societies capable of evolving democratic systems and institutions? Or do different societies evolve different sets of mechanisms? Now, granted, we all now have achieved some sort of global consensus on what democracy is, right? We, we know that it involves um, representative government through elections. It involves uh, uh, having um, a rule of law and respecting pluralism and differences and, of course, inclusion within those differences, separation of powers. Uh, uh, safeguarding fundamental rights and freedoms, particularly uh, you know, freedom of expression and uh, the press. A whole system of good governance, of systems and institutions, particularly of civil society, to safeguard this pluralism and freedoms. But the, the most important thing for any democracy is that the agenda is owned by the people, is defined by the people, as an authentic, homegrown, appropriate, and evolving system with its own uh, expressions. That's why when I talk about Palestinian democracy, I'd like to place it in context. I'm not a neocon, and I told you last time, they love to decontextualize, and I love to contextualize. And being a medievalist at heart, I go overboard with historicism. But the basic question, and that's the approach I'm going to take with the Palestinians, but the basic question is, can democracy thrive in absence of freedom, the most basic freedom? Does democracy prosper when you have a nation under occupation that is practically enslaved, that has no rights whatsoever, that is externally contained? And uh, I've decided that uh, in the Pal Palestinian context, that there's been a constant struggle for freedom, but also for uh, democracy and for uh, building a system of good governance internally as an act of will, as an act of self-empowerment. Now, there are several basic features uh, in Palestinian history. I'll try to summarize them very quickly. First is that Palestine has been in modern history, not contemporary only, but modern the last few centuries, has been under foreign domination. It's never been really entirely independent. After four centuries of Ottoman rule, of course, we had limited self-rule under Ottoman rule, local governments, but overall it was, especially in the 19th century, it was uh, Turkish institutions, national institutions, that in many ways attempted to subsume the Palestinian national identity. And we were part of greater Syria, 
But at the same time, there was a recognition that there was a Palestinian identity. It's not something that evolved very recently. And in the early 20th century, of course, one of the greatest uh, or the most decisive developments took place that uh, affected Palestinian history, which is, first of all, the Zionist movement, and then the Zionist, uh, the, the declaration, the Balfour Declaration of 1917, the Treaty of Versailles 1919, in which the Arab world was divided. And uh, that was the treaty, supposedly, that was supposed to make the world safe for democracy, in which the, the many of the seeds of uh, instability and discontent and conflict were sown in our region. And uh, Palestine was placed under the British mandate, a decision took place, I think, 1920, and then 22, the British took over, and uh, continued with some of the older practices of the, the Ottomans by, for example, looking for local leadership through uh, families and dignitaries and so on as subcontractors for the uh, occupation or for the British mandate. And at the same time, there was a rise of resistance um, the formation of political parties, also related to political parties in the Arab world. Um, many institutions of government had to do with religious institutions, like the Supreme uh, Islamic Council and, uh, of course, the Grand Mufti Institution, Husseinis, and so on. But at that time, also, there was the rise of middle class and civil society, and if you read some of the literature of that period, was amazingly enlightened and progressive. I think I told you last time how about my father wrote about women's rights in the 1920s. And uh, people like Sakakini and so on who wrote uh, all sorts of um, uh, books on education and, and uh, the, the beginning of the women's movement. Granted, it was urban middle class, but it was also a very crystallized, educated women's movement. And it was quite political at that time. But anyway, even under such conditions, there was uh, an insistence on education, on uh, self-government, on resistance, actually, to, to the British, knowing that there was clear collusion between the British Mandate and the Zionist movement to create the State of Israel. And the, state, the creation of the State of Israel, 1947, and the War of 1948, was one of the most decisive moments and one of the greatest historical injustices done to the a nation, done to the Palestinian people, where you had uh, dispossession and dispersion of the Palestinian refugees. And uh, it became the largest refugee population in the world. And at the same time, the division uh, of uh, uh, Palestine into West Bank and Gaza, where you had also later on two legal systems, uh, the Jordanian system in the West Bank and the uh, Egyptian system, but not the legal system, because in Gaza there were um, Palestine laws based on the British law, the Drayton laws. I don't know if you know them. And there was a Palestine constitution actually in Gaza, which was also drafted by the British. In the West Bank we were uh, under, uh, we were annexed to Jordan and therefore we evolved a different legal system and the Palestinians joined the Jordanian uh, parliament and so on. Uh, Gaza was administered by the Egyptians but not annexed. The Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, West Bank including Jerusalem in 1967, which is the occupation of the remaining 22% of historical Palestine, of course, uh, again, um, formed a turning point, a transformational moment in history, which has determined uh, the course of Palestinian history ever since, and has formed, again, one of the most basic uh, situations of, um, I call it enslavement, but <coughs> captivity of a whole nation. And as a result, of course, we have another feature of Palestinian reality, which is dualism. Uh, you have, on the one hand, Palestinian refugees. On the other, you have the people in their own land under occupation. You have Palestinian exiles and Palestinians who are under occupation. We have the West Bank and we have Gaza. And then we have the rise of the PLO, and I will talk more about this 
as a leadership in exile, a representative national address. And uh, that took place actually before the, the um, uh, occupation of 67. The PLO was formed in Jerusalem in 1964 by the Arab League. Uh, Shoqeri traveled uh, all over and he managed to invite Palestinians from all the uh, countries surrounding Palestine to meet in Jerusalem in 64 in order to launch the uh, Palestine Liberation Organization in 64. But in 65, Arafat uh, was appointed or, or elected as head of the PLO. And after, 19, after the 1967 war, the uh, factions joined the PLO, the different militant factions, uh, resistance movement, uh, joined the PLO, and therefore it became more and more um, an independent Palestinian organization rather than an offshoot of the Arab League that was established in 45, but uh, under uh, Arab control. And gradually, the movement to uh, towards the independence of Palestinian decision-making uh, crystallized. Now, with the PLO and with the revolution, you have a situation of armed resistance, armed struggle, militarism, and so on, which most people would know is not conducive to the building of uh, transparent democratic institutions, because when you are involved in an armed struggle, you certainly work underground and you work within a cellular structure and, and so on. So uh, even then, the, at least the language was quite prevalent because the very popular expression of uh, Arafat and others that this was democracy in the jungle of guns or weapons, in the sense that it was pluralistic. The PLO contained all the different organizations and parties and so on, but it also attempted through the PNC, which is the parliament in exile, the Palestine National Council, to represent Palestinians everywhere. So they had people from different unions, trade unions, women's unions, teachers' unions, youth, and so on, to be represented in the PNC as a parliament. And since they couldn't have elections in every country, the uh, specialized unions had their representatives and they joined the PNC as the larger national legislative body. And the, this legislative body elected, so to speak, the executive committee, which is the uh, executive body. Now, there was no real judiciary, of course. It, it wasn't uh, operating in an independent state. And after 67, there was this... Uh, split the separation between the people on the land and uh, the uh, leadership outside. Uh, in uh, Rabat in 1974, the Arabs declared that uh, the PLO is the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, and to all the Palestinians it became uh, a system of national representation and an expression of identity and a tool of self-determination. That's why we became very, very possessive of the PLO, as Secretary Baker knows. Not because we looked at it as something that is sacred, but we looked at it as a safeguard for Palestinian national identity and for Palestinian refugee rights and as a unifying principle. Of course, it was flawed and remains flawed, but at least this is uh, what it meant to the Palestinians. And the Palestinian people and the PLO also expressed repeatedly that there was no alternative leadership. Israel repeatedly tried to form alternative leadership to the PLO, whether by creating such uh, quizzling organizations like the village leagues, local leaderships, and so on, or even later on by supporting Hamas when it came out, thinking that it will challenge uh, the PLO, but it didn't work out. So part of the movement of resistance under occupation was not to accept any alternative leadership, which, if you look at it objectively, contradicts the requirements of democracy, where you have to have a peaceful transfer of authority through elections and so on. But uh, because we held on to the PLO, we evolved a system of imbuing it with value and therefore resistant to change. And because alternative leadership was looked upon as treason, since Israel wanted to create a cooperative, collaborative system, uh, the, the question of change of leadership or challenging leadership 
became something that was very difficult within the uh, um, psyche of, of the Palestinians. And when uh, Rabin and, and uh, Arafat signed the, the uh, Oslo Agreement and the Statement of Mutual Recognition, they signed with an organization. They recognized, Rabin recognized an organization and said he recognized the PLO as the leader of the Palestinians, while the PLO recognized Israel as a state. And there was a qualitative difference. Because they recognized that the PLO was in a state of defensiveness, actually, and uh, at that point it was a lifeline that we give you recognition in return for recognition of the state of uh, Israel. And this is where uh, people said they signed to save the organization rather than to save the cause. But uh, at that time the cause and the organization were intertwined. It was difficult to separate them. Again, uh, the symbolic stature of, of the PLO and uh, the way in which it interacted with people made it resistance to peaceful transfer of authority. Now, the people under occupation, because we were in, in different places, you had the people in uh, exile as refugees at the mercy of host countries, and in most cases totally deprived of any rights, particularly in Lebanon, but that's another issue. The people under occupation maintained a dual role of resistance and steadfastness, but it was largely nonviolent resistance, and steadfastness remaining on the ground, refusing to leave. Um, and with a stress on education, which is something that all Palestinians everywhere emphasize, the fact that education is your source of security, something you take with you. They may take your land, they may kick you out, they may demolish your home, but they cannot uh, take what you have in your head. So with an emphasis on education, building institutions, NGOs, universities, unions, and so on, this became a principle of organization and of uh, order under occupation and resistance to uh, the Israeli occupation. The first intifada, we called it you know, institution building as a form of resistance and a battle of wills between us and the Israelis. In 1967, as uh, you know, we had the first and only municipal elections under Israeli rule. It was the first time the women participate. And at that time, the um, dignitaries and the people who worked with Israel, the collaborators and so on, lost the elections. And the PLO supporters won in local government elections. And it was largely due to the women. And many people blamed us for uh, that vote. But we politicized local government elections. But that was the first and last time uh, Israel uh, refused to let us have elections after that. Even um, uh, professional elections, union elections, and so on, we carried out in secret, actually. It was illegal to do that. But uh, uh, we had the, the local government elections. The PLO supporters won. Immediately, the Jewish underground TNT blew up uh, a few of the mayors, uh, you remember, uh, they blew up, uh, they booby trapped their garages and so on, and then the others who survived were kicked out. Um, uh, Muhammad Milham, uh, Karim Khalaf, and so on. These were the people who were elected at the time to represent the PLO, and uh, they were exiled. In 1987, the Intifada uh, broke out, and as I said, as an act of resistance, it was a period of self-empowerment. Popular committees, neighborhood committees, uh, even under occupation where it was illegal, you could go to jail for 10 years for belonging to a neighborhood committee. We still had them, and we still uh, had elections to elect people who were in charge of uh, different areas of life, uh, including when the schools were closed, we set up alternative and underground schooling. When the universities were closed, we taught in our homes, in our backyards, different places. So to us, this was the, the highest uh, point of disobedience and resistance to occupation, popular resistance, but with full loyalty to the PLO. And we were a people without a direct government, but the PLO was a government in exile, and sometimes without a direct constituency, except those in the refugee camps, and quite often where it was, it sought to create a surrogate constituency, like in Lebanon, for example where they provided services to the people 
to the refugee camps, but also to the people of South Lebanon who were deprived quite often of uh, real attention. And they made many mistakes, but uh, trying to find substitute people is, <laughs> is not something that uh, is appropriate to a Palestinian leadership. Um, and outside, the PLO certainly was open to the influence of the Arab system of government because they were familiar and they operated within the uh, Arab system. In 1988, and as a result of the Intifada, another uh, landmark took place, which is the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable document written by Edward Said and um, uh, Mahmoud Darwish. Uh, and that remains one of the basis of the Palestinian uh, definition of self and of value and of identity. Now, three, the nature of Palestinian leadership and the source of legitimacy. We have on the one hand armed struggle, revolution, military operations, number of fighters and so on, even connections with the Arab world as being the decisive, the determining factors of the legitimacy and power of leadership in the PLO and during the revolution. Uh, underground leadership was quite different in, uh, under occupation because it was um, uh, a secret leadership, the, na the two national fronts, the National Guidance Committee, and uh, the unified national leadership of the Antifada and later on the political committee, with no hierarchy, no privilege. People under occupation could not afford to be public leaders. You had to be underground and you paid the price. So it was a very popular type of leadership, very close to the people, connected, grassroots, and so on. Uh, and uh, the Israelis could not accept that. They immediately either exiled or imprisoned any leadership that came out. And that's why we call this the political decapitation of the Palestinian people. And at that time, the women's movement uh, flourished, was very powerful, actually took a leadership role in, uh, in politics and in resistance. And it was clearly a democracy from the bottom up, exercising democracy without any of the trimmings, but actually a popular democracy. But with the signing of the Declaration of Principles after the Madrid talks and, and the, the Washington talks and then the signing in Oslo, or the Oslo uh, Agreement, which was seriously flawed. And if you want me to talk about this, it will take me hours to tell you what all the flaws were. But the DOP, actually, the Declaration of Principles, stressed security at the expense of human rights and democracy. The DOP valued the Palest or evaluated the Palestinian role only in relationship to Israeli security. Huh? And therefore, they were needed in order to, de to deliver security to Israel rather than to deliver freedom and human rights to the Palestinian people. And this was one major criticism of the Declaration of Principle, in addition to the phased approach, in addition to the separation of the people and the land, to dealing with the side issues rather than main issues, postponing the key issues uh, to the end without any uh, assurances. But when the exiles returned, we were faced, as usual, like South Africa and other places, with two competing cultures. And they were competing cultures. And we said it's going to be very difficult to unite the experience of what you call the outsiders with the insiders. How do you unite the experience of a leadership in exile and military struggle and, and revolution with the people under occupation? So it was uh, difficult. You had a history of struggle as a source of legitimacy, but you, on the other hand, you needed to set up a system of meritocracy and professionalism. And gradually they developed uh, some abuse of authority and a sense of entitlement because they weren't questioned. And uh, there was a conflict between, again, the political authority as leadership and civil society, especially as a competition uh, over um, legitimacy and over funding. And that's where we started getting a search for legitimacy from outside sources rather than uh, from within or from a constituency. And we began to see violations of human rights and rule of law and the proliferation of security forces. But at the same time, we established systems and institutions of accountability, including the first um, uh, ombudsman, 
empowered by law, which is the Palestinian Independent Commission for Citizens' Rights or Human Rights, and the first reform coalition, which became a branch of Transparency International, AMAN. And, of course, all these things I worked with, the National Reform Committee, uh, plus the PLC, uh, which is the basic reform uh, institution. And at that time, women had a serious setback because there were uh, rewards and fruits to be had, and so the men decided that it was their domain, that when you set up a system of power and privilege, it's the men who had to <coughs> take position, and the women were you know, told that they can either go back to the kitchen or they can you know, sort of enjoy themselves dealing with issues of social justice and good governance and NGOs and so on, but leave the business of government to the men. And that's when we began a, a real confrontation on issues of women's rights. Now, for elections as a source of democratic legitimacy, the first national elections, even though under occupation, uh, took place in 96. The 1995 electoral law was drafted as part of an agreement with Israel. And I don't want to go through the genesis of all this because it was very difficult. But anyway, we ended up in 1996 with two elections, presidential and legislative. They wanted to have only one council, which was both executive and legislative, but we insisted on uh, legislative. We had 88 uh, members. It was a historical precedent. People were quite euphoric about it. There was a sense of excitement that for the first time we have a representative body, we have a legislative body, we have uh, an elected president and so on. And actually it was quite fun because the one person to challenge Arafat was a woman. Samiha Khalil, as you remember, and he kept boasting that uh, he was challenged by a woman, he did not get 99% of the vote, and he did not come to power on a tank. So it was to him a source of uh, legitimacy. We had five women in the PLC out of 88, three Fatah and two independent. But because it was a constituency-based election with, with very narrow constituencies, certainly it worked against women and against the younger generation. Because when you, the smaller constituency you have, the more family uh, and tribe goes into play. And therefore, the, the families choose their candidates and they fight for their candidates and they're generally the older family men. And so the younger people and the women could not really challenge uh, within the, these uh, constituencies. But we did manage to get five seats for the women, and uh, some of the younger men got in. We legislated 335 laws. It was largely Fatah, because Hamas boycotted the elections, and the PFLP boycotted the elections. But the others who participated did not succeed in, in getting seats. So it was Fatah and independents, like myself, who were there. But within Fatah, because it was very fluid, you could always find partners. You could always find different currents on different issues and form alliances. And we did on issues of reform and, and corruption and so on. Um, and uh, uh, it was the, the PLC, actually, that came out with the first corruption report in 97. And it was the PLC, and uh, I was a member there, where we wrote the first uh, also reform plan. In the meantime, our uh, um, judiciary was rather weak. You remember all the lawyers had been on strike under occupation, most of the lawyers, so we didn't have judges and we didn't have lawyers who had been practicing. So we had to look outside to try to get some Palestinian expatriates back. And uh, it was quite a weak uh, judiciary with the two systems. We needed to uh, unify the systems and upgrade. And we needed to legislate because we didn't have enough laws. We didn't need the Jordanian laws and the Egyptian laws. In 97, we uh, issued, we passed the basic law, which was ratified only in 2002, amended in 2003 and 2005. But that was a very important document. Along with the Declaration of Independence, it remains the basis of the Palestinian legal system. Huh? The uh, basic law in, in itself honors or expresses its commitment to all international charters, human rights uh, uh, conventions, and so on. But because we are not a state, we may express our commitment and our intent, but we cannot be bound by it. We cannot join uh, the international community because we don't have any sovereignty. Uh, so 
uh, that we took our commitment very seriously, actually, despite the fact that uh, there were mainly statements of intent. The factions, on the other hand, had a serious problem because they started at this phase losing constituency, particularly the left-wing factions, uh, and they were undergoing some sort of identity crisis because you, uh, you were a national liberation movement, you were um, um, a resistance uh, and arms struggle uh, group, and now you were living within a sort of social system that demanded that you have a social economic program. And they also resisted the idea of having a law that uh, would regulate the work of uh, different uh, political parties, because they didn't see themselves as parties, yet they were living within a system that expected them to behave like parties. And they were challenging the uh, prevailing party, the Fatah, for uh, a peaceful transfer of authority. So in, in some sense, they, they became uh, sort of victims of the face. That's why in the elections in 2006, all of them could not make a numerical difference. The Democratic Front with FIDA and with the People's Party, which used to be the Communist Party, all three got two seats. Uh, the Popular Front, that used to be enormous, the second largest party, got three seats. Uh, we formed a block in one month, we got two seats. People say, well, that's not enough. I say, that's an, a remarkable feat, because in one month we got two seats. So uh, anyway, we, we couldn't make a numerical difference because the situation was extremely polarized between Fatah and Hamas, and we can discuss that later. But uh, Hamas uh, certainly began to challenge um, the uh, PLO and the national or more secular uh, parties because it was perceived to be gradually uh, more towards working more towards resistance, armed struggle, it was perceived to be uh, standing up to Israel. It was perceived to be delivering services and an honest system, as opposed to corruption or abuse by the nationals. And so, in a sense, the writing was on the wall. When we had the local government elections, and we fought, and we legislated to have affirmative action for women, by the way, uh, Hamas won in most areas. And that was an indication, and we said, the nationalists had to do something in order to regain their constituency. They had to uh, carry out a, uh, a really conscious exercise of reform. And I even said last time they needed a public mea culpa because of their abuse of power. And they had to democratize and, and so on. But they didn't. Anyway, with the elections of 2006, Hamas won. And the PLC never took off. Actually, it never took off for a variety of reasons, the, the Legislative Council. At that time, uh, of course, we had, the year before, we had presidential elections because Yasser Arafat had passed away. Uh, most people still believe that the Israelis killed him because it was no secret. Sharon declared that the decision was taken. They were waiting for the time and the way and the means. But with the passing of Arafat, again, you had another period of transition. Because Arafat, in many ways, represented a sort of larger-than-life national figure. People were willing to forgive him his trespasses, but they weren't willing to forgive others. And he was seen as a national leader with symbolic standing and, and embodiment of uh, identity and struggle and so on. So when he passed away, I remember I was asked, what do you expect now? And I said, when you have such a larger-than-life figure, you do not replace him with another one. Uh, you replace him with institutions and laws, and, and that's the only way to have stability. Um, even though the initial period was quite stable and smooth, and we had elections and, and so on, and Abu Mazen Mahmoud Abbas was elected as president, when the election of Hamas took place in, in 2006, the legislative elections, of course, Hamas won also because Fatah was in total disarray. It was a total mess. They canceled each other out. They ran two lists against each other. In every constituency, they uh, had more uh, Fatah um, candidates than seats. So it's not that Hamas suddenly became the majority. It's that Hamas was quite disciplined, quite well organized. They got out the women. They had a candidate for every seat and so on, and they won. And Fatah was busy committing political suicide in front of everybody. 
Um, and at that time, we came uh, across two problems. Fatah could not relinquish power. It still maintained a sense of entitlement. And Hamas could not wield power because it didn't know how to. And it wasn't ready. And we ended up also with the external uh, intervention uh, after the, the uh, abduction of Shalit, Israel, of course, abducted uh, uh, 40 members of the Palestine of the Legislative Council, mostly Hamas, and so it totally paralyzed the council because Hamas lost its majority and, and would not allow the council to meet without its automatic majority. And uh, uh, even though at, at certain points we promised that we wouldn't take any earth-shattering decisions that would uh, not uh, meet the approval of Hamas still, uh, we never had a quorum, so we didn't meet after that. Now, as you know, I, I don't want to go into too many details, but uh, gradually matters came to a head, and uh, we had uh, confrontations December 2006, January 2007, the Mecca Agreement, putting together a government of national unity, which was not recognized. And uh, ultimately, at the end, uh, we ended up with a civil war in June that has led to a very serious split in the, between the West Bank and Gaza. Now, Gaza uh, is controlled by Hamas, which is creating a system of centralized control, very close system which can be very oppressive. And in the West Bank, you have a system that has become in, in many ways abusive in the sense that it uses the security excuse as a way of violating rights. Uh, and yet it is prospering, while in uh, the West Bank is economically prospering, let's put it that way, while uh, Gaza is under a very tight, strict siege, still reeling from the uh, war on Gaza, that uh, constitutes war crimes. But anyway, we'll get to that later if we have time. The 2010 elections that should be happening in January are essential because when you are in a state where you have such uh, conflict and such a rift, the only way out is to get back to the people and let them have their say. There are some encouraging signs, of course. The, the, for the first time in 20 years, Fatah had its elections, so it had some sort of reform, its, its revolutionary council and Central Committee and the PLC for the first time had elections and so we in some ways tried to restore the legitimacy of the PLO. But the most difficult part of in, in dealing with Palestinian democracy is the issue of external interference. Of course, it's obvious that the Israeli occupation is uh, the uh, most pervasive and intrusive system of control, displacement and oppression. And yet, under occupation, you have tension between nation building and peacemaking, tension between resistance, uh, armed struggle and, uh, versus popular uh, resistance, and state building or negotiations. So I was asked today, how do you uh, define resistance when you are involved in negotiating with your uh, oppressor, with your occupier? And of course, uh, Israeli unilateralism, especially with the settlements and the uh, violations and so on, and the horrific war on, on Gaza, all had a very detrimental effect on Palestinian reality and on the Palestinian emotional well-being, let alone Palestinian democracy. So here you have a traumatized people with no sovereignty, no rights, totally vulnerable, and then people say you should have free and fair elections. Last time I told you we may have free and fair technical elections in the sense that there was no fraud. But at the same time, they were tainted by the, um, uh, the, the violence of the occupation. They were tainted by the conditions in which we existed. And uh, people react to these conditions. So instead of what we call evolution of statehood and devolution of occupation, we ended up with the opposite again. Now, the Arab influence, of course, was, is important. Generally, it's conventional wisdom for people to say the Arab world was against the Palestinian state because they were afraid of the spillover effect or the contagion of democracy, which is no longer true, actually. We will see why. But the Palestinian question and the threat of war and the security issue was a very convenient excuse for the Arab world to avoid uh, accountability and 
democracy. Because the, the threat, the military threat, the security threat was always a convenient excuse. We have to face this. And so uh, diversion of resources, oppression of people, and so on were uh, allowed, were permissible in, in uh, facing a national threat. There was no accountability and no democracy. Now it's, I think it's the opposite. Now the Arab world has realized that they're being challenged, not by Palestinian democracy, but they're being challenged by the more Islamic parties and the, the more extreme parties that are rising and gaining power as a result of the perpetuation of Palestinian suffering and the uh, ongoing uh, injustice. And so they're seeing in the solution of the Palestinian question a way of maintaining their rule and their legitimacy rather than the opposite. And uh, at the same time, uh, the Arab world is polarized. There is a rift in the Arab world, and that reflected itself on the Palestinian rift, taking sides and so on, and vice versa. Now Egypt is attempting to uh, uh, carry out a role of mediation and reconciliation. They proposed, they gave us a paper a couple of weeks back, and they're going to have an, a meeting in October after the feast, and we'll see whether they can um, influence reconciliation. Now, the U.S. role is extremely decisive, not just in a strategic alliance with Israel and the fact that Israel is a domestic issue, but in its impact on the region and on the Palestinian question as a whole. Um, historically, we talk about two schools of thought. Historically, the Palestinians and the Arabs looked to the U.S. as a savior and the 19th and early 20th century, again, we're talking about this, because the U.S. was not seen as a colonial power, but as a colonized power. They fought against the British, after all, you know, so we had something in common. And uh, there was a great deal of, of goodwill to the um, uh, Americans, uh, directed at the Americans from the Arab world, which they squandered very easily. And, uh, uh, anyway, then, then there's the other school of thought in the U.S. that looked upon Israel not just as a, a, a strategic ally, but also as a source of identification. And this is the settler mentality. We talked about Jean Kirkpatrick, who said that, of course, we will sympathize with Israel because we're the, the settler nation. Huh? And the settlers are the ones, the Israelis, who are taking over Palestine in the same way as we came from Europe and so on and settled uh, the U.S., the America. So the, these two strains of uh, thought continued against the indigenous population. But in modern history, let's put it that way, the first Bush administration was the first one to launch a peace process for a variety of reasons, and I'm sure you will give us all those reasons. Secretary Baker soon, but uh, after the Gulf War, certainly they felt that they had to deliver to the Arab world and they needed some stability and and so on. And they dragged Shamir kicking and screaming to negotiations in Madrid. It was the one time in history where you had an American administration ever threatening to carry out any type of sanctions against Israel for violations. The only time in which they linked the loan guarantees to the building of settlements. Uh, this was unprecedented, but it was also not repeated ever. And now we have uh, a different thing. Anyway, um, <laughs> to the, the difference between the, the Clinton administration and the George W. Bush administration is remarkable, because on the one hand, you have the peace process as being paramount. It gained a life of its own. It became an objective most important thing. And it was a way of delivering Israeli security, but certainly nothing having to do with Palestinian democracy, human rights, or nation building, uh, or even national rights. Now, with the Bush administration, you had the opposite. They left a political vacuum, and they gave Israel time and space to wreak havoc in the region. And then you had the whole neocon agenda, which I talked about last time, the broader Middle East, the greater Middle East, the new Middle East, and they intervened negatively with the war on Iraq. And they decided that uh, with this war on terrorism and so on, that our problem is what the UN Human Development Report uh, said, the freedom deficit, the knowledge deficit, and the lack of uh, women empowerment. So they said the, 
that these problems have to be dealt with. George Bush gave us a speech. <coughs> said the Palestinians have to change their leadership. They're nice people, but they should change their leadership. They should write a constitution. They should carry out a pervasive reform pl- program and so on to qualify, you know, to join the human race. Well, we told them we had our own reform movement. We had a basic law. I said we'd be perfectly happy to write our own constitution, provided they let us define our borders and bring back all our nationals from outside. And then he realized that it's a bit difficult to write a constitution under occupation and unilaterally define all these things. So they said, okay, but you need to change yourself from a presidential democracy uh, because at that time, remember, Sharon had decided that Arafat was, uh, what did he call him, um, not illegal, irrelevant, and he boycotted him. And the Americans decided to boycott Arafat as well. So he said, you have to change your system from a presidential system to a parliamentary democracy. And they persuaded enough people within the PLC to actually carry out the changes. That's why I said the basic law was changed in 2003 and 2005. And 2003, we devised the position of prime minister, uh, and we took away quite a few of the powers of the presidency, gave them to the prime minister, and so on. So the American emphasis on democracy, external democracy, defined by the US, undermined all the homegrown, authentic, Palestinian democratic efforts uh, at reform and nation building, because they were seen as dictates from the West. And whenever the West come up with prescriptive statements, of course, they undermine the people who've been working at them for a long time. Now, <clears throat> again, another blow to democracy was in the reaction to the elections of 2006. Everybody decided to boycott the Palestinians, and we were placed under sanctions because Hamas was elected. So what kind of message are you sending the Palestinian people? Democracy is fri- fine, provided you guarantee the outcome or provided you elect the people we like. Uh, And here we were for decades under occupation asking for sanctions for some kind of accountability for Israel, and they said, don't even dream of it. And we elected the wrong people, and we found ourselves under sanctions, and we were already under occupation. So it was really very strange for the Palestinians to understand that they did something really wrong, and they're being punished. Overnight, over a million and a half people ended up without an income. Because when they stopped working with the authority, it wasn't Hamas they were punishing. They were punishing the mainly the normal, ordinary people or Fatah or the nationalists who were in the government. It wasn't Hamas. Hamas had its own money, and it smuggled its own money, and it had its own institutions. But the people who suffered were the people in government and the PLO people. But in the meantime, that certainly sent the wrong message about democracy. And we felt, again, that we were deprived of our role as opposition. Hamas won't let it govern, we're the opposition. Instead, they usurped our role, so the Americans and the Israelis became the opposition, and we couldn't because if we opposed Hamas, we'd be accused of playing the American-Israeli game instead of the Palestinian opposition. So that, again, distorted uh, domestic uh, realities and uh, democracy. Again, they destroyed the institutions. They destroyed, Salam Fayyad by that time had built an, uh, a serious and, and transparent professional institution, fiscal institution at, at the um, Ministry of uh, the Treasury. And without any funding, now you ended up with smuggled money in Gaza and you ended up with what was called TIM, the Temporary International Mechanism of handing out sort of assistance to Uh, people, poverty alleviation, and so on. So we lost a major institution that we had built. That aggravated tensions between nation building, peacemaking, resistance, and liberation, all of them. Now, I'll just get to Obama's promise very quickly. When Obama was elected, he made the right noises. I'm sure you all agree. And we said we need the right moves. The right noises need to be followed. He sent us Mitchell, as uh, George Mitchell, as, as an envoy. He's highly respected. People felt that he means business. He made the Cairo speech, which the rest of the world felt is a clear departure from the past, understanding and so on, cultures and multilateralism and established policy priorities and the peace process and so on as being uh, a priority. 
And people thought, now we're going to see for a change a new administration. Instead, he sent Mitchell to the region. Mitchell met with, with Netanyahu time and time and time and time again. He said, you have to stop all the settlement activities. It's in the first Mitchell report. It's in the uh, Obama speech. It's in the roadmap. And it's an international law. You cannot steal other people's land and, and uh, transport your people there. And uh, the Israelis said no. Netanyahu said, I will keep settlements in and around Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is ours forever and ever, even though it's occupied territory. He said he will build uh, uh, 450 new uh, units. They will continue the 3,500 units already being built. They will continue with public institutions being built. They will continue building in the major settlement clusters because they think that these are going to be in Israel as a result of any agreement. They will be annexed to Israel. So instead of getting, and then he talked about settlement reduction. Uh, uh, the Americans talked about freeze, we talked about cessation, because these are antithetical. You cannot build settlements and talk about a two-state solution, because you're stealing the land on which the Palestinian state is going to be built. It's not a question of preconditions. But anyway, so Mitchell was faced with this wall of total I would say arrogance and, and refusal to cooperate. And he judged that the Palestinians did whatever they could in, in accordance with the agreements. And they insisted on having this trilateral meeting today. We had decided that there should be no trilateral meeting because we've had enough of symbolism and atmospherics and you know, photo ops and so on at the expense of the Palestinian people. As usual, I mean, now we're seeing sliding back to form. Whenever you have, whenever you're met with extreme Israeli intransigence, what you do is put pressure on, you think, the point of least resistance, on the Palestinians. In the meantime, the Palestinian leadership is negating. It loses, negating itself with its own people. It loses more and more credibility because the more it plays the game, the American way. And this is exactly what happened. So today you have this meeting. You had this meeting between Netanyahu and uh, Obama and uh, Mahmoud Abbas, and it weakened Abbas further. It sent the wrong message. There is no agreement. The Israelis are not cooperating. There is no peace process. You can't talk about a meeting next week uh, when you don't have a basic agreement on what you're meeting about, and then say that we have uh, negotiations. Now, you, send them, you want to send a message that you're serious about peace, then you take a stand and you hold Israel accountable. This is the one thing we need to see for a change from an American administration. Uh, the, this government in Israel has not only increased settlement activity and built the wall and so on and continued the criminal siege of Gaza, but it is also asking for payment in advance by saying that it wants to normalize with the Arab world in exchange for agreement to negotiate. And Netanyahu talked about economic peace rather than uh, political peace. Now, within Palestine, more and more people, and outside probably even more so, are talking about a one-state solution, one person, one vote, as the sort of ultimate democratic solution. Um, the question is, is this a political program that's workable, or is it a de facto inevitable outcome of the Israeli settlement policy and expansion and lack of will to affect the two-state solution? In Israel, of course, there's an attempt to Zionize the Palestinians and the Arabs by saying, as, as he kept saying, that a prerequisite for any negotiations is for the Palestinians and Arabs to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, as a right to exist as a Jewish state, which means you are negating your own history as a Palestinian, you are negating the refugee rights, you are negating the rights of Palestinians within Israel, but what you're also doing, as far as I'm concerned, is violating my principles, that I want a democratic, pluralistic state, inclusive state. I don't believe in exclusive states, and I don't believe that states have to have religion. It's that problem, but at the same time, why should I adopt a language that's not mine? Huh? Why should this be a prerequisite for the Palestinians to become Zionists in order to become kosher? Something very strange there, but it's a way of evading any kind of commitment. There's another... Um, move now within Palestine, which is building uh, the Palestinian state from inside out, so to speak, a de facto state, rather than declarations of sta statehood, but 
continuing building institutions uh, and, and so on, as a source, as a proactive agenda and as a source of internal empowerment. But there's also the rise of the boycott, divestment, sanctions movements, different systems of accountability for Israel. We need recourse to international law, not just for the wall and the ICJ ruling that should be uh, implemented. Now we have the Goldstone Report. This was a unique opportunity for the world to tell Israel that you will be held accountable, that we will not continually give you an American cover. Huh? Instead, this didn't happen. But if you want the Palestinians to be engaged in nonviolent resistance, you have to give them recourse to law, to the rule of law, to a global rule of law. You have to recognize their nonviolent resistance, whether Belain and Alin or nation building uh, and, or boycott and sanctions. But ultimately, democracy has always been a constant motif and commitment in, in the Palestinian discourse and life. What we really need is the freedom and the positive engagement to remove obstacles, eliminate impediments, to end the occupation, to give us the right to self-determination. And I guarantee you we can be extremely democratic. Thank you. I had to let Hanan go through her excellent analysis, so we have time for just a few questions, so I'll be able to take two or three. Here. Yes, uh, we hear that there might be some differences between the Damascus-led uh, leadership in Hamas and the Palestinian Hamas. Uh, can you comment on that? And also, do you see any road map at all that brings Hamas and Fatah uh, better together? Yeah. Okay. Well, there are always different opinions and different points of emphasis within any movement. I mean, movements, whether Fatah or Hamas, are not monolithic. They are not, you know, strict regimented parties. So you do have different voices, and you do hear them. And they sometimes have public disagreements. I don't know how permanent this is or ideological this is. Sometimes it's a difference uh, in, in ways of resolving a situation. But generally, the further away you are, the more hardline you can be. The more, the closer you are to the situation, the more pragmatic you are. And because there has been an ongoing dialogue internally between Hamas and others, it's much easier to uh, evolve a common language than it is when Hamas is in Syria. Also, the emphasis, the, the influence, external influences uh, certainly play a role in shaping attitudes and perceptions, whether it's Syria or Iran or others, or whether it's the West and Israel. There are all sorts of external influences shaping attitudes. So we do hear differences. But as I said, they may not be permanent. And they may not be ideological. Uh, as far as the conciliation and internal bringing Hamas and Fatah together, there have been, as you know, since 2005, there's the Cairo Agreement, which talked about the um, um, reform and upgrading of the PLO to bring Hamas into the PLO. And we agreed to have national elections for the Palestine National Council so that Hamas will also run and will Hamas and Jihad and will be part of this representative system. They won't. There are also there was also a dialogue before that, and there was a, a, an agreement called the National Accord Statement, the Agreement of National Accord, which was drafted by the prisoners, the Palestinian prisoners, and adopted by the different factions. That was before Mecca, and after Mecca, as you know, things fell apart and we had the civil war. Um, now, um, there have been several meetings in Cairo, sponsored by the Egyptians, as mandated by the Arab League. And uh, as I said a few uh, weeks back, the Egyptians gave us their document, their proposal as to how to bridge the gaps. And they will be holding meetings uh, soon. I think the only way to solve this is first of all by dialogue and reconciliation, by accepting differences, but accepting them within a democratic system, setting up systems that are inclusive, and ultimately by going back to the people and having elections and accepting the results of elections. Uh, 
why do you insist to have the only to have the only democracy that is Jewish in a tiny country to to have democracy just not knowing that that's going to wipe the, the Jewish character and, and the existence. I didn't understand. Why do we insist? Why do you insist to have democracy in that little state and and have a, your majority to inhabit in the rest of the state of Israel? We're having democracy uh, as part of the Palestinian system. Now, if Israel continues to annex the land, it will annex the land and the people. There's no way it can take out the land without the people unless it expels us all. And that's where you end up with, um, in the long term, a Palestinian majority. But what we're offering Israel is a chance to have a two-state solution. Over, you know, we, we've accepted, we've accepted 22% of historical Palestine, which is certainly not seen as a just solution by many, many people. But having accepted that in the PNC of 1988, Israel should have jumped at the opportunity. But since it's not, and since it's confiscating more land and, and expanding de facto and annexing and so on, it means that it wants the one state solution. And then you end up with the demographics and, and with the sort of uh, one person, one vote approach. But Israel certainly is not keen on giving the Palestinians IDs or, or giving the Palestinians passports or citizenship and so on. And it's desperately trying to get rid of us in a variety of ways. But as I said, we're not ready to disappear or leave Palestine. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, as an American looking at the Middle East, what I see is that since the UN partition, Israel, despite being at war for that entire period, has built a country. Whereas the Palestinians have been at war, and all they've built is two or three terrorist groups, and now a civil war. The question is, when are y'all going to turn from confrontation to building for your own people? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a real oversimplification of reality, isn't it? In addition to not really dealing with facts. But the thing is, Israel had all the support it needed from the world. It was given a land that belonged to the Palestinians. It was given unconditional support and funding. It was given collusion uh, by the British mandate and then later on by the UN and by the Americans. I mean, the amount of money poured into Israel by the US is just enormous. And actually, the occupation was one of the most profitable experiences for Israel. They suddenly found themselves with a captive population that had no other consumer source uh, other than Israel. And it, it expanded at the expense of the Palestinians. Now, we were the ones under occupation. And in spite of the occupation, we built ourselves. We were the ones who were in exile as refugees. And in spite of that and, and the horror of the situation, the Palestinians survived and built their institutions. And yet you're back. So and it's not, not building anything. So, yeah, it's I wish a civil war. We have built quite a bit, okay, given the fact, you've asked a question, given the fact that we have no freedom, no rights, and we're absolutely vulnerable, and we get shelled and bombed regularly. So that's the thing. I wonder if Israel or any other people were in that situation, would they have survived like this? I think Francoise. Okay, Francoise. Well, I, I, I'm biased. I need. <laughs> well, I, 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 am, I am too. And I want to say, after hearing you way too short a time, we could have heard you really for hours. One, I would like to say, you should run for president. <laughs> uh, I would like to say that despite the. the the events, the, the sad events of the last uh, 60 odd years, that it, 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 what you have just talked about really shows a lot of the Palestinian people uh, traits of uh, intelligence and, and endurance. I mean, it speaks a lot because there are not that many successful uh, countries when they are 
mm-hmm. being occupied like that. Mm-hmm. But so uh, I'm not expressing myself. Well. No, I, I get what you're saying. Yes, but well, that's that's very kind of you. But the Palestinians certainly have shown endurance and resilience, and the ability to survive. Remember, they were saying that. Who was it who said the old will die off and the young will forget, uh, and the Palestinians will be absorbed and and uh, there will be no Palestinian uh, nation anymore. So it, we proved them all wrong that we are uh, we have our own will to survive but to prosper also, and the spirit of staying on our land and and building our, ourselves and refusing to be perpetual victims of history. So our problem is that we are challenging an occupier that's extremely powerful and that has universal support and that is seen. Some people, you know, use cliches like the only democracy and so on. I don't see a democracy that enslaves another nation and maintains itself as a democracy. But anyway, uh, the question is how do you bring the Palestinians within the world consciousness as an equal? Because we've always been treated as subhuman species, deprived of the protection of the law, and Israel was treated as a country above the law. So we need to be to gain this consideration as an equal among a community of nations deserving of all these rights that other people enjoy. And we are adamant, and we will stay there, as I said. So thank you for your confidence. Unfortunately, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Hanan. Our time, unfortunately, is over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.